the 10 leading causes of cancer and what you can do about them. There is really one thing everyone can do to significantly reduce their risk for the most common type of cancer, as well as many other types. And which cancer we're talking about and what measures you can take, we'll look at in this video. We'll discuss the 10 most common causes of cancer and what we can actively do about them. And we'll also address the question, why don't we all get cancer? Many people think that cancer is a fateful disease and that there's nothing more you can do for prevention. The saying goes, live intensely and let your genes decide the rest. But it's not that simple. There are, of course, genetic mutations that cause cancer. This means you can inherit bad genetics from your parents. Consequently, the risk for colon cancer, for example, or ovarian cancer or breast cancer is increased. All these are types of cancer that can be genetically inherited. Women with the BRCA1 mutation have a 72% chance of developing breast cancer by the age of 80. This knowledge is, of course, useful so that we can detect these diseases, the cancer, in its early stages. Because at that point, no matter what type of cancer it is, it is definitely easier to treat. No one should really die from colon cancer or prostate cancer anymore because these cancers are easier to treat and detect in their early phases. Of course, there are also cancers that are more complicated, like pancreatic cancer or glioblastoma. But fundamentally, all these early detections do make a difference. And now there is good news regarding this genetic predisposition to cancer. And this is completely overestimated by people because only just under 5% of all cancer cases actually arise this way through genetics. However, there are of course a lot of influencing factors throughout our lives that are not inherited, which can then damage genes and cell processes. And we will take a closer look at those right now. And the number one reason for such gene mutations that we can acquire over our lifetime is the consumption of tobacco. And according to estimates, tobacco caused around 7.7 .7 million deaths in 2019. The trend is rising. And what sounded like a dream solution for smokers, namely the use of e-cigarettes, vaping, nicotine-free, is now under heavy suspicion. Because a new study shows that the number one type of cancer, which is lung cancer, can also be triggered by these new e-cigarettes. Here, the state of Tyrol in Austria, in collaboration with the University of Innsbruck, a university in London and in Bristol, and the German Cancer Research Center conducted a large study. They showed or investigated how does tobacco or these substances that are vaporized through e-cigarettes affect the so-called epigenome of various cells. And one must imagine the epigenome like this. On one hand, we have the DNA and we have the epigenome. And the epigenome is the software that controls how our DNA functions. You can think of it like this. DNA is like a massive cookbook with recipes that determine how the body works, how you look or which cells in the body are rebuilt and so on. The epigenome is then a collection of notes, markings or bookmarks in this cookbook to highlight certain recipes. So they get cooked more often, so to speak, or to emphasize the intensity of certain recipes. In other words, it dictates what information should be processed and what should be rebuilt from our DNA. And it has been shown that tobacco is a very, very significant risk factor for lung cancer, laryngeal cancer, oral cancer, and many other types of cancer. These carcinogens, the substances contained in tobacco and e-cigarette smoke, can damage DNA, cause heart and lung diseases, and ultimately lead to cancer. And the result of this study was that the cells, the so-called epithelial cells, which normally line the organs, cause a cancer-promoting epigenome in smokers. And that this also happens with the use of e-cigarettes. And that was the big problem. This was especially observed in the mucosal cells in the mouth and esophagus, but it was also seen with the use of snuff, which is absorbed through the nasal mucosa. They examined 3,500 cheek, saliva, urine and blood samples. And now it gets interesting. With an accuracy rate of 90%, it is possible to determine whether cells pertain to a smoker, e-cigarette user or snuff user as they exhibit harmful drift from tobacco or chemicals. Obesity stands as the second leading cause of cancer, a fact often overlooked by many. 
The absence of physical activity indirectly fuels obesity, substantially heightening the chances of developing breast, colon and cervical cancer. This heightened risk is mainly attributed to insulin resistance, underscoring two primary factors contributing to the association. 2-3 to 3-4 of people with overweight have a malfunction in insulin regulation. This means insulin is the hormone from the pancreas that opens our cells so the sugar we consume can enter the cell where it needs to be processed and if we eat too much sugar over a long period we put ourselves in a state of insulin resistance. The insulin doesn't work properly anymore. So what does the body do? Quite simply, it increases the amount of insulin. And this then leads to the release of the so-called insulin-like growth factor, a growth factor. This growth factor can promote the growth and multiplication of cells, essentially pushing the body towards cancer. The second problem is the silent inflammation caused by this excess weight. Overweight triggers inflammation and here again, through such silent inflammation, the body is more likely to enter a state that favors cancer metabolism. Additionally, there are problems with fat metabolism, stress reactions and so on. These also lead to inflammatory processes which can then promote cancer development. Some studies suggest a link between stress and the development of certain types of cancer. However, this is not yet scientifically conclusive. It's important to know that prolonged stress can significantly disrupt the immune system. It's also crucial to understand that glutathione and detoxification mechanisms are vital for maintaining immune function and other cellular functions. And we should do everything to ensure our adrenal glands and stress axis are in good condition. Staying on topic, poor nutrition leads to obesity and many foods can significantly increase cancer risk. This includes processed foods, essentially anything that comes in bags and packaging. For example, red meat, too much sugar and trans fats can increase the risk. I've already made many, many videos about this. It's important to know that it increases the risk of colon cancer and stomach cancer, for instance. And we should, of course, follow a truly balanced diet. That means lots of fiber, lean protein, especially plant-based protein, which is linked to a longer life. The research is really clear on this. Whole grain products, proteins and other vital nutrients play a significant role. In essence, the Mediterranean diet continues to be paramount. If you are in search of a diet that integrates these extensively backed nutrition guidelines, simply scroll down beneath the video. I have curated a week of complementary Mediterranean diet for you to sample what foods are beneficial for me and have scientific validation. The query persists, why isn't cancer prevalent? Essentially, DNA is consistently shielded and restored to avert issues. We have a well-functioning immune system. It plays an important role in recognizing and eliminating cells that could potentially become cancerous. Of course, we also have the genetic hereditary aspect that we've already mentioned. We have lifestyle and environmental factors that we've discussed here, but we also have cell aging and cell death. And when all of this doesn't work properly, cells can grow uncontrollably. They don't die off as they should, and we end up with unregulated cell processes. And our goal should be throughout life to do everything we can to keep these cell processes regulated. With all these tips we keep hearing, and that I also give you in this video. If then, the cell processes remain unregulated, cell masses form, tumors develop, and then, very seriously, metastases. And that triggers massive inflammation. And that's the big problem with cancer, that you ultimately die from this inflammation, that the body literally eats itself up, literally burns itself up, and this inflammation can no longer be controlled. So do it while you don't have cancer. A glass in honor can harm no one. And science has practically encouraged us to drink red wine daily over the past few decades. But it can contribute to the more frequent development of cancer. More specifically, an intermediate product in alcohol metabolism, acetaldehyde, is suspected of being carcinogenic. And now some professional societies are backtracking, like the WHO. In 2023, they stated that any alcohol consumption is very, very risky. And the recommendation from the World Cancer Research Fund says we should not drink any alcohol to prevent cancer. And in the European Code Against Cancer, we find the same recommendation. Everyone who drinks alcohol should reduce their consumption to avoid cancer. And it's best not to drink alcohol at all. 
Most people have probably never heard of the next point. It's about radiation exposure. Of course, we know that ultraviolet rays from the sun can damage the skin. So just follow the medical advice given to you for skin protection. Of course, you should keep an eye on your vitamin D levels and so on. We don't want to discuss that. It's about another danger and that's radon. Our human DNA can be damaged very, very quickly and very, very severely by radiation. Every child knows this, for example, with radioactive radiation. But what very few people know is that in Germany and worldwide, there are certain regions where this gas called radon gas is produced. Radon is a byproduct when uranium decays and gets released. Radon gas can accumulate in basements or on the ground floor of your house. This means that radon gas is the second leading cause, the second leading cause of the most common cancer, which is lung cancer. You have a significantly higher risk if you have radon gas in your basement at home and even more so if you also smoke or use nicotine. Make sure you can measure your radon levels. Check online to see if you live in an area frequently affected by radon gas. This radon forms in the ground and then diffuses through the walls into your house and basement. There are certain protective and defensive measures you can take if you have it. But as I said, it's important to know if you have radon gas in your basement, yes or no. And what many people have always or what has been discussed for decades is, does cell phone radiation actually cause cancer? And here there are good and bad news basically. In 2011 we had a major study or a warning from the WHO that cell phone radiation might cause cancer but over the years it has been shown through many studies like the UK Million Woman study. For over 20 years women were studied here. It has now been shown that there is no increased risk of tumors in people who use a cell phone. Recently there was a publication from the so-called Cosmos project they included a quarter of a million mobile phone users in this study who had been using their phones regularly for 15 years or more. They looked at whether there was an increased incidence of brain tumors, acoustic neuromas and so on in this group of people. It was even found that among the 10% of heavy cell phone users who had the highest total number of hours spent on the phone over their lifetime, the occurrence of these cancers was essentially the same as in the other participants who use their phones normally. And in this study, many, many universities and institutes from various European countries were involved. So without question, you should definitely reduce your mobile phone radiation. We also know that long phone calls on a mobile phone increase body temperature. Definitely use a headset, use wired phones and try to reduce electromagnetic pollution as much as possible because yes, it's possible that in 10 or 20 years there might be a different report. And somehow I intuitively think we should really, let's say, consciously deal with this increasing radiation exposure to our bodies. Air pollution is also a big problem and is linked to a variety of cancers. Lung cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, to name a few examples. And air pollution is most common where there are high levels of car exhaust, near highways and so on, where trash is burned. If you think a bit beyond the borders where fuel is burned, near incinerators, power plants and so on, or even when wildfires occur. The big problem here is these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you've probably heard of them, abbreviated as PAHs. They are produced when coal, oil, gas or trash is burned, but also from cigarette smoking, tobacco and even wood. In the fire department, we used to say that fires burned more honestly in the past. When a living room burned out, there were significantly fewer toxins because only wood was burning. The polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons existed back then too. And now when we burn certain materials like plastic and so on, we really get intense toxic exposures. And yes, waste incineration plants have good filters that remove all that. But what happens illegally around the world is another story. It's important to note that smoked foods and so on can also contain these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So try to avoid consuming them regularly. And it's really crucial that we also consider microplastics. We know that the biggest source of microplastics is tire wear from cars. We now ingest about a credit card's worth per week. So around five grams of plastic weekly enters our bodies. And if you've seen my video about microplastics, by now they've also been found in the deposits in the vessels leading to the brain. The main sources of air pollution must, of course, be eliminated globally. 
And if you're doing any DIY projects or something similar, don't run your car, moped or motorcycle in the garage and stand there in the toxic fumes. These are just things you can avoid. Or if you're sanding or grinding something, simply wear a mask and if necessary, a good FFP mask to reduce exposure. Let's talk a bit about infections. And here it's primarily the viruses that can increase our cancer risk. If you think about the hepatitis B or C virus and liver cancer, or the human papilloma virus, HPV, and its link to cervical cancer. But then there are also other viruses like those from the herpes group, Epstein-Barr virus, certain herpes viruses and so on. These can increase the risk of cancer, which is why they are called pro-oncogenic viruses. And what is the mechanism here? I'd like to briefly explain that to you. We have a defense system against these viruses and this defense system also helps to recognize and kill cancer cells. We're talking about natural killer cells. These are my personal hero cells. I absolutely love these cells and I clearly see that many, many people have poor killer cell function. The killer cells in these people are present, but they are lazy, they are poorly or not easily activated and they do a poor job. And this is exactly the point where over the years we can slowly slide from a viral illness into a cancerous state because an important part of the immune system is weakened. What do these natural killer cells like? They love vitamin D, they love selenium, they love zinc. So all these standard things we always recommend to boost the immune system are also so-called non-specific killer cell stimulators. Then we also have some Chinese medicinal mushrooms that can specifically stimulate the killer cells. There are probably 50 or 100 different substances that we can partially test in the lab to see what specifically and individually stimulates the killer cells. Your killer cells are crucial. Don't rely on a general statement. You can get a killer cell test done it's a blood test. Specialized doctors can perform this test. If you're interested in this topic, I'll put a link to my immune course below the video. If you're affected by this, can you overcome this virus tendency or the tendency to constantly get infections? I'd say yes, but you really need to keep an eye on your killer cells and get them specifically tested. In my experience, this is the biggest interface and leverage point that can do good for virus defense and cancer defense but it's also the one that's poorly studied. There are many chemicals, including household chemicals that can contribute to cancer development, such as benzene, formaldehyde and asbestos. These are of course harsh chemicals that we know, but also arsenic. And maybe you've read about it. Uh, currently, university libraries in Germany are recalling tens of thousands of books or you can't even borrow them anymore because there's a suspicion that these books might be contaminated with arsenic. It will be very interesting to see where this goes. Chemicals you use at home can also be a problem. Why? You always somehow absorb them through the mucous membranes and how often do you quickly grab a cleaner without putting on rubber gloves or a mask and so on. So you should be really, really careful with oven sprays, chlorine cleaners, drain cleaners, toilet cleaners, grill cleaners and so on. Ventilate your home and take protective measures. It's important to know that you can get very far with natural cleaning agents like soap, vinegar, baking soda, orange oil and so on and you don't really need these harsh cleaners. Another very very important thing when we talk about chemicals and pollutants is heavy metal contamination. I've already examined thousands of people with heavy metal contamination. It's one of my specialties and recently there was a video on YouTube where one of my colleagues downplayed it a bit because there were reports that we absorb heavy metals through drinking water. Of course, there are strict limits in Germany. The drinking water is of outstanding quality. We no longer have lead pipes. They've all been replaced and banned and so on. But one thing consumers overlook, and I've identified so many patients because of this. Our faucets have an alloy, a brass alloy, and it can contain lead. So there are faucets in Germany that make your drinking water lead contaminated. In my hometown, two elementary schools have already been closed because of this and a high school was also investigated and it was even found in an official government building. So this is a real danger, but it's not just the faucets, there's something even worse and that's espresso and coffee machines, especially the high quality 
great espresso machines from Italy and the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment conducted a study in March 2023 and found that some coffee machines exceed the lead limit by up to a hundred times. There are no regulations for this in Germany. And the real outrage in all of this is that the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment doesn't disclose the manufacturers. They want to protect them. So if you use an espresso machine, please do the following. I've linked a water test below in the video. There are also many other tests for heavy metals in water. Run water through the machine and test it. Do you have lead in your espresso water? And especially after the scaling, these aggressive and harsh descaling agents have exceeded the limits for coffee machines, especially espresso machines. When you do this back flushing, it seems to aggressively release lead. It's not the case with all espresso machines. I had an espresso machine from a very, very renowned and expensive brand and I'm bitterly disappointed. It also makes me a bit angry because these espresso machine manufacturers still use lead soldering and everyone knows that it's really harmful to health. So as I said, what can you do? First, after descaling, rinse the machine very, very well. Don't descale too often and just check if there's lead in your coffee maker by doing a test run without coffee grounds. These tests cost around $20 to $40 depending on the manufacturer. As we age, it becomes more likely that our cells undergo certain genetic mutations that can potentially trigger cancer and there are studies on this as well. The question is, why does cancer occur more frequently as we get older? because we can no longer repair DNA as reliably and quickly, the genetic material is consistently safeguarded and repaired, leading to a propensity for uncontrolled cell growth. A significant number of cancer cases are identified in older individuals, typically around 66 or 68 years of age. This underscores the importance of undergoing early screenings. I'll reiterate, Early detection allows for more effective treatment. Make sure to schedule your screening. It doesn't necessarily imply immediate therapy initiation. But the important thing is first to get the information. Do I already have changes in my cells or not? Is something growing there? Is anything suspicious? And then you can just react much, much better. Please share the video. I appreciate my channel members who support me and the channel. We'll see each other again in the next live stream. There we can also discuss the topic of cancer and treatment methods. Otherwise, I'm happy if you tune in for the next video. Thanks for listening and see you soon.